Good science. You're on the air. What do you feel when you hear a record like Tupac's new one? I love Tupac's new record. Right, but don't you feel like that creates uh, tension between East and West? He's talking about killing people. I had sex with your wife, and not in those words. But, he, but he's I talking about, I want to see you deceased. No cap. To live and die in L.A. California. Oh, yeah. What you say about Los Angeles? Still the only place for me that never raises the sun. To live and die in L.A. Yeah. Where every day we try to fatten our pockets. Us niggas hustle for the cash, so it's hard to knock. Everybody got their own thing coming. See, chasing worldwide through the hard times, worrying faces. Shed tears as we bury niggas close to heart. What was a friend that was ghost in the dark? Cold part about it. Nigga got smoked by a feet. Coming to you from Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California. LARB headquarters, by the way. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I'm Colin Marshall. Today, speaking with not one but two writers who have collaborated on a book about i would say two still though in death the best known rappers to have ever lived it's tupac versus biggie an illustrated history of rap's greatest battle my guests are jeff weiss and evan mcgarvey tupac and biggie they're they're rappers who i mean even people who are completely ignorant of rap they know their names uh they both became they both blew up in the 90s they both were murdered in the 90s what else unites Tupac and Biggie. You wrote about Tupac, Jeff. I'll start with you. Well, first of all, I mean, not not to get all Southern California and astrological, but they are both Gemini's, and they sure. both they both you know I, the funny thing about Gemini's, I think, is like most people with their signs are kind of like you know outside of you know your typical Topanga Canyon kind of crystals <laughs> and sunshine kind of person, they tend to not be like. But Gemini's, when you talk to them, they'll be very staunch about that. And so I think they the, one of the things about them that unites them is they both have kind of these like polarity you know what i mean they're very extreme kind of personalities and i think those kind of personalities there's two ways that you can go you can either be best friends or worst enemies mm. what was interesting about tupac and biggie was that they were both mm. yeah i think the idea that you have two very different artistic voices that developed they developed in dial well not in dialogue they have nice harmonics when you lay them on top of each other you know both Tupac and Biggie, for instance, were far more middle class than a lot of contemporary hip hop listeners might be aware of. Mm. And both were afforded opportunities in education um, and really lived different narratives. And I think sometimes um, the received one right now acknowledges um, they were both incredible craftsmen uh, at a time when their art, their practice really became commercial. And those can have incredible forces both on people and on, you know, the act of creating something. Um, and I think on the most basic level, the fact that their lives and deaths line up and um, the fact that their deaths and their murders were um, cultural events within a few months of each other. Mm. Um, I think those are all reasons why they're not, each is not just compelling, but they're really inseparable. Mm. Now, looking at all, at all the representations of Tupac and Biggie in this book, I mean, because you've included so many works of art that are about one or the other, or especially both of them that depict them, they're on the cover. I know these two rappers died in their mid-20s. I know they never reached my age, mm -hmm. but at, in some sense, I look at them and they, feel, they seem like more aged men than I will ever be. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that, it was interesting because I was reading, a, we we're having a discussion tomorrow with a Layla, Pine, Layla Steinberg, who was Tupac's mentor, and she was talking about the first time she met him, and she, she was 25 years old, and she was a mother of two. Mm. Tupac was 17 years old, and he, she met him in like a 21 and over club, and she always thought that he was the older one. Mm. And if you listen to their, both their music, there's this like strong sense of nostalgia to it from a very early age, you know? And like, that's not uncommon. There's kids like Chance the Rapper, Kendrick Lamar, they're both young guys, a mod. I was thinking of back in the day being nostalgic, but it's an interesting personality type, especially when you're dealing with a with a hip like a medium like hip-hop which is in inherently kind of progressive forward even though you have the samples that are always kind of looking backwards mm -hmm. so i think both of them really definitely touched upon that and and they 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 might have come from middle class you know childhood which i think you know when you're middle class often you could you have the uh you can afford to kind of have the time and leisure to kind of reinvent yourself mm -hmm. but i also think that they um they really had been through, a, you know, a struggle, whether it was, you know, Biggie in New York, you know, the immigrant struggle, you know, his dealing crack for however long he did it with Tupac. It was kind of this root, rootlessness being moved around from New York to Baltimore to the Bay, mm. you know, to Southern California. And, you know, I think like every every artist has to find their own struggle. And I think those two really kind of honed in on it and kind of brought it to larger than life. 
You mentioned you mentioned Tupac's journey across the country to get where he got, which was here, Los Angeles. And this is a book not just about rappers, but about two cities, about New York and Los Angeles. It seems like, you know, at first you can say, Tupac, well, he wasn't really of Los Angeles because he went all around. But then that, that makes him more of here, doesn't it? Because he had to go, because he had to take that journey where he gets uprooted a lot that makes him more of los angeles doesn't it yeah i mean like you know you go to any bar in los angeles or a sports bar i should say and like you know you'll find a different team being rooted for and i think like la is it's i mean i'm like third generation but it's you know you meet somebody and they're like really you're from la and it's not like and i'm like well my parents are from like, and then you're like your grandparents are from la and then it's sort of like you, you don't get that much of that and it's like los angeles i always th- think of it like a you know, a lot of people kind of treat it like an atm and sort of like get your money get out as fast as you can and don't linger right well they do that with new york too don't they i mean there's a certain sense which biggie knew that people did the atm thing with his hometown right yeah i mean i think i think that the city's uh galvanized, obviously, as it would anyone, um, especially artists. And I'll say that, especially artists um, living in cities as different as New York and Los Angeles. Mm. Um, I think that what's important to think about New York and the ATM is that essentially it's a machine, right? Mm. This is what architects have argued about New York. This is what um, sort of finance capitalists exercise every day, Mm. uh, that New York is, is constantly churning and turning over a machine and I think as much as Los Angeles's rootlessness was, you know, key to an aesthetic of Tupac and something Tupac recognized in himself, I think this idea of kind of like machine worked exchanges mm. where really, really messy parts of the self and the body can kind of get caught up in the gears. Um, that I think is really is what I saw. And I think what's in the book about the, the interaction between, um, New York and Biggie. And, you know, New York's an older city. L.A. kind of is, is a much younger city and it's kind of still being mm-hmm. born in its own way. I mean, in the last 10 years, it's kind of I mean, New York, you could argue right. that, too, with. But, you know, I think I think every kind of major American city at this point is sort of you know gentrifying. It, it, it's, it, it's interesting that Biggie, I mean, I'm sorry. No, but Biggie's I was going to say Biggie's brownstone is, you know, <laughs> for that, sale for like that New York magazine store. I don't know if you saw this. Show, but, you know, this this idea that a luxury apartment that Biggie Biggie wrapped from an avatar of 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 of. Things he knew about, like dealing crack cocaine. Coogee sweaters. And Coogee sweaters. <laughs> and just as important, right? And, and now, you know, things have changed so much that this place he grew up in, which was, you know, working class, working class middle, lower middle, mm. is now going for a princely sum on the New York real estate market. Yeah, well, that's, I think, just an interesting measure of how close it was to being middle or upper middle right. at the time. Because, you know, it's like no one's living in the projects right. in Marin. You know, or like in Baltimore still. I mean, no matter what Beach House and Dan Deacon try to tell you, I don't think Baltimore is going to be a uh, kind of hipster mecca. I mean, even though it sort of is in some it, small way. But it's not like New York or L.A. or, you know. You, you, it's your first question. This is Evan. You know, to your first question, I think what you talked about, their intertwinement and their overlaps. What's interesting is they're both so deep that you can spiral off into these directions mm-hmm. of – geography of spirituality of economics of identity of language like they're both so rich Mm -hmm. um that's in a way why they're so inseparable i mean they Mm -hmm. can you know i think a common interesting thought in literature is you know contemporary artists have to manage data and make choices because there's so much data in Mm -hmm. the world and i think both tupac and biggie are like absorb data and arrange it perfectly like tupac understood Tupac, you know, used rhetoric and Biggie used genre structures. They're so incredible for their time and just perfected. And I think that that's what's interesting about the conversation we're having right now. So we could talk about cities, we could talk about many things, mm-hmm. but really, the, both the artists are so rich. You can have this about a lot of different sort of elements. I mean, to kind of add to that, you know, I feel like when I first, started, you know, before even we, we started working on the book, I'd always kind of had the notion that you were either a Biggie person or a Tupac person. Mm. And it was sort of how, like, you're a Rolling Stones or Beals person. Right. Like, I like I always liked both Biggie and Tupac. You thought you, thought you had to pick. Y- yeah, well, well, definitely in the 90s, yeah. you had to pick. When, they, when they were alive, you had oh, to yeah, pick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At some yeah. point, you had to I, And I think you could make the, the last case was, was Nas and Jay-Z was probably where you actually had to pick. Yeah, but even that, even that has the shadows of the Tupac-Biggie rivalry. Completely. Yeah, totally the shadows yeah. of that. I mean, also, not to kind of kind of go into digression, but what's amazing about this is there were there was never we know the title of the book you know and I kind of honestly like I probably shouldn't say this but I, you know I regret the fact that it's it's rap's greatest battle because I think like the time has come where like these two should they definitely will always be side by side but it's time to, you know they would have they would have squashed their beef like sometime after nine eleven or something you know like like it's like some ugly moment you know it's it's like some weird awkward 
right. you know. But it would, I mean, it definitely, it would probably would happen way before then. I'm sure it, mm. but I, I think like, you know, you are the, are the one of those kind of people. And with, with, with Tupac, you know, it, it, t- it tends to be like the more the people that kind of identify with the gangster side, you know, Scarface mm-hmm. is their favorite movie, you know, even though if Biggie, Biggie, they're more of a king of New York. It, too, well, too, it's interesting. I mean, <laughs> Tupac's, well, it is, it's like the king of New York thing because Tupac's influence, I think culturally, I think everyone would argue, has just, especially internationally, kind of outstripped Biggie's, right? Oh, yeah. The murals of Tupac are in many countries. Yeah, and you cities. include a lot of these murals. Yeah, we do. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the great things is to show how visual their whole relationship yeah, was. Right. I mean, Sub-Saharan Africa, you go to any swap meet and you, you'll find it's, a Tupac mural. I was, I, was, I was working, I was living and working Spain. in Samoa for six months. Yeah, and, so I, you include, and I, and I, I, saw, and Samoa, I saw kids, I saw kids, Samoan kids, who had most likely never been off island, mm. wearing Tupac memorial t-shirts and, and listening to, you know, whether it was keep your head up or ambitions as a rider, like he he is a he's and that's and that's an asymmetry that makes their relationship interesting. Right. You, you could make the case that you know from birth he was sort of you know his name was Tupac Amaru, he was named after an Incan emperor. You really? could say that he was like from birth stamped to be like that. Whereas Biggie, you know, his mom was Jamaican, but he didn't have a traditional. You know, mm-hmm. he didn't. He, his name is Christopher. I mean, it could yeah. be it could be from anywhere. And mm-hmm. you know, he sort of and yeah. Biggie really, you know, he never was. He never necessarily – he didn't deny it. I mean there are songs like Super Cats, Dolling Me Baby that we were playing earlier where he does like a Jamaican kind of song. But it wasn't like it was a very – you don't think a Biggie right, was right. Jamaican. No, no, you don't. And that's that's interesting. Even um, Busta, I would say, who is Jamaican as well, you think of more like that. It, it, you know, I think that's, that's a really interesting point because um, one of the things that I think – we have, you know, different charts – and lists in the book, and I think this is. F- I actually like. I really like doing the sidebars and lists, and sort of we'll call it interstitial because I think it's interesting. But you were talking about the photos, and also the way the book is lined up. So, you know, we have things like you know lists of influences because whether it's lists of influences or whether you know, I think it's really funny when you have you know Tupac's best guest verses and you write about them epigra- epigrammatically and memorably. Um, I think you know this book ultimately as a thing is trying to show how. I used the word rich earlier, but I think you use Gemini. There's this doubling. There's just so much you could talk mm-hmm. about. You really could. Um, and I, I think we tried to get as much stuff in the book as possible. Yeah, without being, I mean, because you, the, the thing is, like, I think everybody's heard the story. Right. I don't think anybody, you know, and it's like without getting into like, we didn't want to like sit there and be like, all right, let's, we're not, we're not Nick Broomfield. We're not going <laughs> to solve the case of. Yeah. A, what, it's a wise crack off the gun. Solved the case. Yeah, exactly. And, and you then, made more money though. And this idea that that is, I mean, that that obviously is part of the story. But this idea that they're they're murders. I don't know. I've often felt that there are a lot of there have been there have been other excellent books written about Tupac. Oh yeah, murders. Randall yeah, Sullivan's yeah. book was actually very good. Uh, she about, Hilary Coker's book with yeah, Biggie Labyrinth is like the definitive. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, yeah, and there were there were I mean, Tupac's interviews and yeah. in vibe. Was gr- were great because he just was such an all time great interview. It, it, essential reads of the Tupac text. Yeah, I'll, I'll use that. And you have to. Yeah. Uh, no, they're great. Which and is I, interesting because you don't you don't think of a Biggie interview. I mean, there's a. I mean, Biggie was a great interview, no doubt. But it was, yeah, no, I know. What you, I know what you mean. Sorry, I keep sitting back. Um, I, I think it, I think it cuts to the fact that like Tupac was always looking for a way to communicate with as many people mm-hmm. as possible. Tupac also was very receptive to the press and that got him in a lot of trouble because when he was in New York, he kind of buddied up to AJ Benza, the gossip columnist. Oh, sure. Uh, now, I, forgot, I forgot about him. Yeah, <laughs> it was like. Him, Mickey Rooney, Madonna, and like, which is just such an amazing like New York in the '90s. Like, you almost imagine like Howard Stern outside selling <laughs> Snapple, <laughs> and like, oh, dear. yeah, no. It, and he kind of, you know, said some things to AJ Benzik on the press, and you know, a lot of people did think that that had something to do with the fact that there was that first shooting in New York. Did, did Tupac Jeff uh, let his let his fans, let his followers? Did he craft a persona? Did Tupac Shakur craft Tupac? In, in such a way that it was a bit of a Rorschach blot, his fans saw what they wanted to see? Yeah, I definitely think so. Mm. I think they, you can see, that, and that's what's so interesting about him. I think Biggie, we, even from his presence, it's such a rooted, hulking presence. Tupac is like, like live, you know, he's like, li- he's small, he's, you know, he's quick. And you, you can see whatever you want in him because people, you know, he has so many different types of songs. Mm. You know, like, well, I mean, take, you know, to live and die in L.A. That's like yeah. if you if you were like, actually, his first name was MC New York. Like people, most people don't know that. And they'd be like, what? You know, and yeah. And that was when he was in Baltimore. <laughs> so yeah, talk about a confused identity or, or a malleable identity. It's not not confused. It sounds pretty yeah. cal- it's like the opposite Dylan. of confused. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you got to be he, he was Robert Zimmerman at one right. point, And then he, you know, I always think of Jim Morrison, too. 
because Jim Morrison, whereas Jim Morrison kind of lied about his, you know, Tupac definitely, I mean, you can't get a better, like, more interesting backstory. You know, his mom, you know, when he was in utero, he was in, his mom was in the tombs and she was going to get, she was going to blow up all these, like, national landmarks and she's carrying this baby to term. And uh, it just, it's so dramatic. And everything about Tupac, you know, was so dramatic. I mean, he was like, best friends with Jada Pinkett in high school. <laughs> and I always say that he's sort of like, he, he sort of would have just become kind of evil Will Smith. Evil Will Smith, yeah. I like, <laughs> like that counter. But he he could have <laughs> had... No. He... <laughs> I mean, like, I, 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 you know, I wrote a book about Tupac. Obviously, I, I like him. That. But it, he kind of does have a little bit of like a kind of not... And when I say evil, I kind of air quote it. But... You do speculate that had he lived, the best case scenario is the opposite of Will Smith, but on the other side of the fence. Yeah, not being... Uh, yeah, exactly. I think he would have probably... I mean, he was very community-oriented, and I think that's the thing about Tupac. As you get older, I think... If you were like that when you were that young, you probably were only... And, like, you know, a lot of people... There's another... Like, when in the course of my research, there were things that kind of I glossed over, like when Tupac was involved with trying to get a peace treaty for the uh, the Bloods and Crips in L.A., mm. which is insane, because he wasn't even living in L.A. at the time. He was living in Oakland at the time. He, You know, he had just done Juice, which was not a West Coast <laughs> movie either. It wasn't like he done you know boys in the hood it, but it was that's how much people resonated and it's still like you know in the course of like my travels you know whether like when i was in louisiana you know i would ask people uh you know who who was the rapper that resonated the most from you know outside the south and it was just always tupac i mean mm -hmm. little boozy had like a tupac poster mm -hmm. when he would record you have a guy like freddie gibbs who lives in gary indiana that's you know his favorite rapper of all time and mm -hmm. It's what's funny about Tupac is like I feel like Biggie fans like if you're like yeah mm -hmm. like no one's gonna no no one everyone gives it up but like Tup like everyone says Biggie's good no one ever says but Tupac people will like vehem vehemently be like you know we hate or conversely like I was I was mm -hmm. <laughs> right before last night we came over you know we, we're, we're doing this like you know talking about the book and everything so I posted a flyer for the uh, the book reading that we're doing <laughs> and no, no comments and then uh, then all of a sudden someone goes. Biggie's all right, but Tupac peeped a weakness in the rap game and sewed it. Game over. <laughs> People are still talking shit on Instagram. Oh my god! You know, sixteen years it's later. Like, could we have explained Instagram to Tupac or Biggie? I don't know if we could. Like, that's oh my it's god. a different world. Tupac's Instagram would have had like thirteen million followers. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, <laughs> There's me shirtless. I, I think with I, Fat I, Joe. I, I, I think I think I think Biggie's Instagram would have been very well well cultivated, mm -hmm. well shot, melancholy, a little bit, a little, little lugubrious. But I'm, I'm serious. I, I think I think it would. I think it would, it would be very detail oriented. I think. If if we're going to have this uh, hypothetical, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it would be detail oriented and like still life. Um, Tupac definitely would have fucked with some MySpace. <laughs> I, think, I don't think Facebook yeah. would have really been his his jam. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't his Instagram that, though, can you imagine? It would be like, yeah, I mean, it would be, they'd be very, they would be, they would be very can, different. Tyler the Creator has diehard fans. <laughs> <laughs> but even that, it, you know, I think, I think the the idea now that this is a new way that hip hop artists communicate with us mm -hmm. through social, like through everything, social media, right? It's, those are the air quotes. Those are the futurist air quotes. Mm -hmm. um, but but now it's it's different. Now now the way that we receive information and output um, from every music genre, but I think hip hop has been just a rap rap has been an incredible i not it's been a change been an incredible yeah, change I mean, and i should add that part of the reason why we're still talking about them is that they didn't have a twitter and instagram right. to oh, ruin no, yeah. the mystique because like and like props to kendrick lamar for like not being that guy right. that like is all up on twitter and because there is a certain thing that you know you don't necessarily need to know everything and it really would have marred tupac because there's no way that he could not have used that like to communicate i mean i'm yeah. sure somebody like tupac would have loved that because it's like i don't have to deal with reporters anymore i don't have to deal with my words being twisted i can just go straight to the people and it's like you kind of see what kanye west kind of does that too whenever he wants to say something it's yeah. like in a very targeted way mm -hmm. evan uh, there's a uh, there's a I'll, I'll pitch this question okay. to to those for those listeners who don't know much at all about rap mm -hmm. but and th this is i guess let's let's try to drain our all of our opinions out of this response, so I'll try to drain them out of the question, but for people who only really have heard of Tupac and Biggie, I mean, Biggie seems to be, the consensus seems to be, Biggie, as a rapper, technically, was more skilled. Tupac, as a public figure, was more skilled. Hmm. I'll, I'll throw this to you first, Evan. Do you think that's, as the writer about Biggie, do you think that's accurate? I think that that is a constellation in which you can put them. And I think 
it holds up. Hmm. I think there's always a question in any craft about, okay, what's good technique. But I think that, um, Biggie is impeccable. You know, the way he strings words together. I, I mean, I, you could read it anyway. You could read them. You could hear it. Some, I mean, you have to hear them rap. Uh, it was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Something pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. Hanging pictures on my wall. Every Saturday, rap attack Mr. Magic Molly Mall. I let my tape rock till my tape pop. Smoking weed and bamboo, sipping on private stock. Way back when I had the red and black lumberjack with the hat to match. Remember rapping Duke? The ha, the ha, you never thought that hip hop would take it this far. Now I'm in the limelight, cause I rhyme tight. Time to get paid, blow up like the world trade. Born sinner, the opposite of a winner. Remember when I used to eat sardines for dinner? Peace to Raw G, Brucey B, Kick it free. Funk Master Flex, Love Bug Star Ski. I'm blowing up like you thought I would. Call a crib, same number, same hood. It's all good. Uh. And if you don't know, now you know, nigga. Uh. The va- I mean, let's get technical. You know, the vowel chains, the recurring images, the genre inflection. I mean, he does stuff with double narrative. Um, you know, the same story, same plot being told in very different forms. Um, it's you know delightful. I mean, it is. I'm gonna use a word. It sounds, is it, but he's just incredible to listen to. I mean, and he has inflections in tone and voice, and he can do he can balance multiple figures in a narrative, multiple voices, but. And, and I think he, yeah, I think he's the best technically. But I think what's interesting is that that's a different argument, and I think that's a more complex one than the public public figure one, which is like, yeah, Tupac is just far more widespread, maybe more intensely loved. And I I think that might had to have to do sorry have to do with an issue. I don't want to say of craft, but there's a technical thing. I mean, it's the whole we could compare them to poets, and Biggie would be you know more of a Wallace Stevens or a Robert Lowell, very dense. Very and Tupac's more thoughtful. Of, Tupac's like Bukowski Whit- or regard. Whitman, you yeah. know. It's, yeah, or Whitman. And, and we could do this yeah. with directors. We could do this with painters. Yeah. We, I mean, we did but, in, in the course of the book, you know, because yeah. me and Evan are both like huge literature nerds. I mean, Evan has an MFA in poetry, mm-hmm. and um, so basically, you know, and you we, have a cat named F. Scott Fitzgerald. I do have a cat named F. Scott Fitzgerald, but I should say it's the cat. Oh. Just uh, he w- and he was not happy with the Great Gatsby adaptation. Let me tell you, oh, <laughs> him and Boz Lerman. <laughs> but there will never be a Boz Lerman the cat in my household. Uh. But, you know, we, we did go back and forth about that. And, like, you know, to, to, go, to use novelists, it's, it's sort of like like a Jack Kerouac versus a Philip Roth or something. Because, you, you know, you think of, like... That's great. At, at the time. Like, especially at the time, because they're both, you know, Philip Roth's maybe 10 years mm-hmm. younger. But they're mm-hmm. of, you know, similar generation. And, you know, it's, like, an interesting question. Because it's like, well, yeah, like, yeah, obviously, like, Philip Roth, like, wrote Poor Noise Complaint. <laughs> like, Jack Kerouac doesn't have a Poor Noise Complaint. Like, no one has a Poor Noise Complaint. And it's sort of like, that's how I feel about Biggie. It's like, Biggie has, like, you know, the the warning. You know what I mean? Or just, or, like, you're nobody to, like, some or even, uh, I got a story right. to tell. Even, like, these, like, dense, you know, taut narratives. Whereas, you know, tup- Tupac, but Tupac has, like, an on the road. Mm-hmm. And... There's something about an on the road and hmm. that makes people at ev- that will and will always and like it's a big broad idea that it's like I don't know it's like if you're selling a Hollywood screenplay like it, it like right. you, it's the elevator pitch Jack Kerouac has the elevator pitch Ooh. and Biggie doesn't have that like I mean and if you're like a lover of I mean if you're a writer Biggie's like Biggie is a, a, a writer's rapper there's no question hmm. about it and Tupac is more of like kind of like you know if you're like a oral kind of poet or like you know what i mean it's that emotion that rawness that people gravitate towards and that big idea it's interesting it's also tied up in the fact that i think biggie has two albums right many 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 mixtape you know mixtapes but you know many guest spots many demos many freestyles tubug has a much larger studio catalog a much Mm -hmm. and biggie's is much smaller it's just kind of a joke about tupac at this point it's they're there it's they keep coming up. Maybe we've seen the end. I don't just quickly. Have, oh, do we think we no not the end, not the end, Jeff? But continue. Uh, no, I, I mean it's. It, the, but there you go. There's Something. there's another contrast. I mean it's there. Um, it's different to think about that because uh, and 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 how their artistic output and sorry lost my train of thought. Um, well, how 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 do I want to phrase this? It still intrigues me that there are so many things to debate about. But the one thing that doesn't really seem debatable is that Tupac has had a sh- much bigger international response, mm. cross-cutting response. 
I don't the say language, slogans. The language is this. Yeah, and it and he has messages in it and 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 rhetoric. And I said this, and I wrote about the Biggie. feeling too. And this like is you you feel like every yeah. syllable, like it feels like they're being pushed out of it. I mean, yeah. both. And that's another thing we should mention. Both have the like the two best voices probably in hip hop oh, yeah. history. Oh, yeah, it's and incredible. you know it's as as Guru said, you know it's it's mostly the voice, right? It's right. a real. Uh, I, I I I know what I wanted to say, which is that I think that uh, Tupac is so direct and in a cathartic about emotions, emotions and realities about race, masculinity, class, power, violence, sex, and he's so direct, mm, yeah. and that is. He's translatable, right? Yeah. His, his occasional abstractness is, is is translatable, and he he appeals to something that you know. Do we call it the common experience? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's. I mean, that's one of the most Whitman esque things yeah. about it. I mean, just look at a song like Tupac has a song like "Dear Mama," right? And Biggie has a song called "Juicy." Like mm-hmm. "Juicy" is like. It, I mean, it is so much more abstract. It's like this, like right. what, what you know. It's like you're never quite sure exactly what right. you know. But like "Dear Mama," there's no way to misinterpret that. Oh yeah. And Tupac, you know, and you also talk about like you know there there are those there's those two models for writers. There are the there are the writers that are, you know, they have a few darts that they you know that they, they hit it perfectly every time. And then you have those writers that you know, make a book, write a book every single year, or you know, and. Like, I mean, like a Kerouac, I mean, Kerouac's, you know, catalog is just can go on and on. Like, truthfully, you probably only really need like, you know, what on the road, maybe like Big Sur and Dharma bums or. Yeah, I would say actually Visions of Cody, the second half of that is really good. But even then, like, that's like, like, you know, that's to me, that's Jack Kerouac's best moment. And like, you know, it's which is, you know, and he thought it was his best moment, too. And it's the second half of Visions of Cody where he's sort of rewriting on the road. And that's sort of like Tupac, too. Everyone's like, well, he doesn't have that one classic album. And you're like, with Tupac, it's sort of like you're picking your moments. And like, I think that extends to a lot of things, you know, even to show like, you know, like Breaking Bad is like this Shakespearean, you know, or versus Mad Men, where you're like kind of like this. It's like those like little moments that mm. it all hinges on. Like, mm. that's interesting. I don't know. What do Tupac and Biggie in their lives, their the way their careers worked, the way people responded them to them? What does that tell us about the '90s in hip hop or otherwise? Never wear overalls with a <laughs> strap. <laughs> never a good never idea. Never wear overalls. Yeah. Lesson uh, learned. Yeah, never, ne- never, never wear overalls. Um, but I think. Yeah, no, I think there's something that is distinctly energetic and and optimistic, but with an under an undercut of real unease and violence. Um, I mean, this is you know the '80s and the '90s, as things have always been going on. You know, America in ascendance, in absolute ascendance, with a lot of wars and suffering going on in other parts in the, in other parts of the world. Um, and I think there's this, and I think this sort of post Reagan boom shine is clearly detectable on both the surface of Tupac and Biggie. Mm-hmm. But I think when you get under that, there is a real, real like darkness, both in their age of the nineties of, you know, we have the internet now. This is incredible. We have unbelievable access to food. This is un- unsurpassed. More people getting medical care, more people going to university and yeah, yet, it's sorghum like that. There are just <laughs> terrible, horrible acts of violence under the surface. Yeah, um, I mean, and, you, and these these outbursts politically. I mean, I guess you know, I think that with with like Tupac, you know, I, especially in the early part of his his uh, career, he definitely is a product. Of that. I mean, he's at the center of it. I, like you have you have that the the, the guy in, in Texas that shoots a state trooper, and it said it's because he's playing Tupacalypse now. I mean, what a '90s like like what a like you know the record made me do it. You know, yes. like right the CB4 era, like all this crazy. <laughs> you have that, then you have C. Dolores Tucker is like criticizing him. Mm. You know, you have Dan Quayle like speaking out against him. I mean, he emerges as like this flashpoint that's like for like American decay, and I mean, and that's like. That's sort of like, we're not even worrying about like American morals, okay? We're just trying to like get like a stable economy back to have the 90s. I feel like when you're, when you're in the 90s, like, we, there was a, I always joke about it and like, it's a time of limitless peace and prosperity, but it kind of felt like that for a minute. The, the, if you were not, but, but, part but, two, yeah. and I should say that Tupac never forgot that. And the part of his message was that he was always trying to remind people that that you know no matter even at the end you know he did get how do you want it kind of like more in like limos but the first half of Tupac's career is really reminding people that like it was not this like you know Clintonian like Valhalla or whatever you know <laughs> it, it, it is you know there's a there's a great 
biggie line, and I'm going to quote it. I'm going to quote it right. So bear with me for a second. But it, it basically it combines in the same line. I'm seeing body after I'm seeing body after body, and Mayor Mayor, Mayor Giuliani ain't trying to see no black man turn to John Gotti. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the way that those two references are not yeah. just perfectly temporal, but actually, but I shouldn't say they they embody something. You know, both Julie, both former Mayor New York uh, Rudy Giuliani and. Um, Don and Gotti. And um, where New York was going. Right. And where New York was going. But this idea that there, there were these figures that were becoming, that were rising in the world by being brutal mm-hmm. and by kind of breaking codes. And even that just like reference. He doesn't do a whole song about how he's like Gotti or Giuliani. He just puts it in two words in a tidy phrase that is so well crafted and ties in with a greater narrative that you kind of catch yourself going back and you find these things that speak so much to the 90s. And they're so well placed, mm. um, and I think that's. I mean, a that's, a that's just a difference in style I mean, between yeah. Biggie and Tupac, and B this idea that this idea that the '90s have this level of kind of craft and shine, success, prosperity over some really bad stuff. Yeah, but that that I may be getting a little far in that point. It was the last <laughs> time. I mean, I, I guess you could argue maybe Kanye West is like a bad figure, but I think the '90s might have been the last time we produced those kind of larger than life personalities, like mm-hmm. a, a Kurt Cobain. A, you know, you see, you know, who is the next Kurt Cobain? Who is the next two? I mean, you could you could say a bunch of people, a Biggie, mm-hmm. and I feel like it's just also like you know that last gasp of that you know star system that you know mm-hmm. whether the big money major label system, you know, it extends to everything. It was before the kind of culture fractured, so you have these two last dominant figures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. And as I seem to recall, you know, at this time in the mid '90s, with specifically Tupac and Biggie getting so huge, people were started to, people starting to talk on a large scale, or started to observe that these guys probably wouldn't be able to pay for their limos and whatnot if it were not for all of the middle class white kids <laughs> who like to listen to them. We're yeah. three white guys sitting here talking about Tupac and Biggie. Right. Does it matter that the audience that they did seem to get an audience of people who were not like them in huge numbers? Oh, I think that's that is a, that is a fantastic question. I think that is a really really I think it's a really smart question. Um, and I think that's absolutely the truth. I think this is also a time when, you know, CDs are, are, are going everywhere. This is when there were Sam Goody's and Tower Records and you could get reasonably fast access of material on a wide berth and they were relatively affordable in the 90s economy. Relatively. Uh, relatively know, affordable. Sam Goody things. Man, there, there's the 1799s. The <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think, I think it, it has. And there was things like MTV. Mm. And more rap and rap magazines and and yeah, this, I mean, something yeah. exciting in American culture that yeah. brought it into a whole new set of homes that were white and middle class. Mm. Why did why did white kids like them at the time? I didn't really I hadn't listened to much of either of them. It was sort of so too far away from me to really be able to tap into. I mean, every music seemed kind of alien to me at the time. Like the legendary alternative rock of the 90s seemed so angry. I was like, why are you listening to this? You're not that angry, my middle class peers. And <laughs> why, why are you listening to Tupac and Biggie? You're not, you're new, you don't come from there. You know, what, what was the, what was the appeal at the time? You know, I think like, if you, if you think about the 90s, it, it's kind of funny because it, it, culture has changed so much. You know, you think about like in the 90s, I mean, every kid was like white kid, black. It didn't matter. They would like, if you, to be cool, you had to have like a size 40 pair of jeans yes. and like kind of like a hip hop clothing and people would wear their hats backwards. And it was always a real thing, sore thing for me because I look really stupid in the hat. <laughs> so like I knew it and I was like, man, everyone looks so cool. But like, yeah, you'd wear, you know, you wear the hat, you wear the baggy pants, the oversized shirts and like, you know, Thug Life, Tupac was screaming Thug Life. Everyone kind of, that was an appealing thing to kids, even if they were, you know, not thugs in any way, shape or form. And now, I mean, you have, you have like Drake, you know what I mean? It's like totally different. It, it, you know, it's like, it, yeah, I think you're right. I think what's interesting is we, we sort of say, we say this and there's, you know, there's a history of the white middle class having a very special, a special version to black music, hmm. you know, and that is a, that, that is something that is been asymmetrical in terms of power, you know, but it's happened, you know, whether it was Motown, whether it was jazz, um, and that's something that I think we absolutely, you know, as you said, three white guys sitting around a table. And as I hope anyone with Tupac and Biggie about the way that, um, you know, black entertainers are presented in America and seen in America. Uh, and, you know, what we know of their real lives, what we absolutely can talk about with their art. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, you have to ask that question. You know, what? I'll be the, I'll, you know. Putting putting on like my seminar hat, yeah. We I mean, or anybody, and we anyone should have this conversation. Sorry, that's a really pretentious thing to say. <laughs> Edit that out. Edit think, that out. I think it's just uh, the seminar. You know, the, the truth is though. Like, you know, you can point to anything. You can be like, oh, well, it's, you know, typical white people taking the rebellious, and like, you know, and like, but I think at the end of the day. 
they were just good. They were really good. <laughs> like that's why people still care. Yeah, I know. I think that's true. I no mean, one's really like bumping like you know Lords of the Underground records anymore. <laughs> the que- I think the question is is there's right there's always this uneasy relationship of something being fetishized. No, I, I think that absolutely happens. I love Lords of the Underground. Thing, thing, things get <laughs> things get fetishized really easily. Um, I'm almost I sound like Debbie Downer. <laughs> just uh, ebullient. I'm just like, well, let's have a discussion. And it's true. Great. Let's have a discussion about race and power because I think I think it's a, a key part about it. But I I um I do think there there is always fetishization in that way of more of two of black of black of black pop culture of black culture by you know commercial white america but i think the question is at this point we know that you know their lyrics aren't some kind of documentary proof mm. and that seems like a really important distinction they they contain things that happened in their lives but not all the time and inconsistently as anyone does in any kind of oral or written art mm. and when you really think about that then a lot more interesting discussions open up in my opinion right. and that, that's something that the whole of america seems to have been very slow to realize right. about rap is that i guess we've long listened to rock music and taken it literally like the lyrics these lyrics are literally what the guy is saying who's mm-hmm. singing it mm-hmm. and some some people of a certain generation listen to rap lyrics and they're saying, oh, he's saying he's saying he killed people and he's saying you should kill people like right. literally, you know, w- that has that gone away, that literalism he, to a degree. I, 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 Rick Ross would definitely have you insist. I mean, but to be fair, Rick Ross, I would say Rick Ross, you know, uh, it was kind of no one take no one took at once, especially once we, you get exposed. You should break it down for listeners who aren't aware of the full yeah. Rick, the, the Rick Ross. The Rick Ross. Per, no, it's a persona construction. Uh, yeah, it is. I, it is, and it, I think that's based every, on Biggie. Every, every every artist does that. Every artist Andrew always Buck. constructs a persona yeah. to create. Um, but to answer, there was your, a famous t- drug dealer actually right. named, named Freeway Ricky Ross, who, whose name he right. adopted, and he basically you know portrayed himself as like this like you know obese crustacean loving overlord of miami (laughs) you know who just like was the biggest boss that we'd seen thus far and then you know smoking gun exposes him and but so like everyone doesn't take him seriously but i would then say yeah no one takes rick ross at face value but like recently you know there's a big hit song called ubno and rick ross kind of has a lyric that implies that he gave a girl molly and she didn't know it and then he took advantage of her and she didn't know it and the funny thing about it is like molly doesn't do that but it's i mean it's obviously a very inappropriate lyric but you know it it did it did show that you know people still do take rappers at face value. But I mean, yeah, again, it's you know the the wor- the words of young black men are held to the highest you know standard and worst possible interpretations by mm. by large swaths of American culture, white culture. Right. I mean, you mentioned Kurt Cobain. Right. I feel like people who listen to him or who when especially when he was alive said, "Oh, he's speaking directly and truthfully." Yeah. Like I should. I don't know whether that was even Kurt Cobain's intention. Maybe he was constructing a persona in the same way as any rapper, but we take them differently. Uh, I don't know if... How- well, to be fair, uh, rappers take a stage name. Yeah. And there's something to be said about putting that barrier between yourself and, like, you know, when someone... Right. Versus, you know, I would say someone like Kanye West, who has no real stage name, you know, his name is, is Kanye West. Even Kendrick Lamar, who's probably the most popular rapper, his name is Kendrick Lamar Duckworth. Right. Kendrick Lamar is a name. Mm-hmm. And your book isn't called Tupac Shakur versus Chris it's Wallace. Right. Exactly. It's Tupac. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then people might t- think it was about Tupac versus the Fox News correspondent. <laughs> and that was horrifying. You know, and also like, it, in it, its it own way. Seen, even the spelling of Tupac, his real name is not, you know, obviously the number. Yeah. And, but I feel there is that thing. Once you take on that stage name, it, it's implied. Whereas Kurt Cobain, you're like, I'm Kurt Cobain. Whereas like Johnny Rotten, like, I think everyone knows kind of like, okay, there's. Yeah. It's a great compare. I think that's that's right there. That's part of this. How ways to talk about them and ways to ways to think about them. I mean, punk yeah. is punk. You know, is and is hop, is, like is hop does hip hop overlap with Ameri- as sort of the American punk? Sure, it does, but it's not a perfect overlap. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, Jeff, wrote about being at the for, for a kind of a shift of subject. Wrote about being at Coachella last year when Tupac appeared not as exactly a hologram, but something like a hologram, and performed. Uh, you said it was weird. <laughs> it wasn't normal. Come with me. Hail Mary, run quick, see. What do we have here now? Wanna ride or die? La 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 la. I ain't a killer, but don't push me. Revenge is like the sweetest joy next to getting pussy. Picture paragraphs unloaded. Wise words being quoted. Beat the weakness in the rap game and sold it. Bow down, pray to God, hoping that he's listening. 
see a nigga that's coming for me. My, my diamonds when they glisten. Now pay attention, best man, please, father. I'm, I'm a ghost. ghost. Cause killing feels hell, Mary. Catch me if I go. Let's go deep inside the solitary mind of a madman. Screams in the dark, evil lurks, enemies. See me flee. Activate my hate, let it break to the flame. Set trip, empty out my clip. Never stop to aim. Some say the game is all corrupted. Fuck in this shit. Stuck. Niggas is stuck in you. Bust out this shit. And plus, mama told me never stop until I bust a nut. Fuck the world and they can't just. It's just this way of hell, man. Okay, first of all. It's like in this like weird like you almost feel like you're in Disneyland's haunted mansion. You know, it's like this like weird animatronic. You know, it's like you have like animatronic Dre and anima. You know, and then like they bring out like Wiz Khalifa and like Kendrick Lamar, right. and then you're like, and then there is Tupac, and then he's like, "What's up, Coachella?" And and then like you're, I, for me, it just it was I, it's it's weird to see also all these people rapping along the Hail Mary. You have fifty thousand yeah. white kids rapping along to, to Hail Mary. It's a weird phenomenon in its own right. right. People, the most of them weren't alive. And see, I think there's a difference. I think if you were alive when Tupac was great, you would see a hologram. You'd be like, oh, God, just just, just, just give it all. I mean, I never saw Tupac live. I was too young for that. But still, I, don't, I have no interest in that. And But then you have to take someone like, I don't know, you have no prior associations with during your lifetime. So it's like, huh. like if you're like, oh, yeah, you want to see a Hendrix hologram? I'm like, I don't not want to <laughs> see a Jimi <laughs> Hendrix hologram. It was surreal, though. It was, you know... As someone who watched it from a distance, it was ab- it was absolutely yeah. And you could live stream it. <laughs> right, yeah, I've seen I've seen the YouTube video a number of times. Just not because it's an admirable act in any in most ways, but it's an admirable act of showmanship, certainly. And yeah. it's the the fact of seeing. You look uh, a character from Mortal Kombat. I'm sorry, he, to he you. did, <laughs> but it's. I mean, the aside from the technical stuff, seeing the seeing the fake Tupac next to the actual. Forty yeah. something year old Snoop Dogg. I mean, what what do you think when you see that they're they're you know I guess performing together, quote unquote. But just seeing them side by side, what what does that what, what does that raise in you? Um, you know, I think that Snoop. It's it kind of sad, actually. Yeah. Honestly, I think the the thing about this, and then you can't forget, is it's a tragedy. You know, this is a real tragedy. Snoop is lucky. Snoop got to live, and right. I'm I'm happy he why, did. Why is he alive? Is it a surprise he's alive? Yeah, I think so. I think there was one point where Suge Knight was definitely trying to, you know, I I, I wouldn't, I, you know, he went to, I, I think he went to New Orleans for a while when he was doing New Orleans. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that had something to do with the fact that LA was a little hot for him because mm-hmm. you couldn't just, you know, you can't just leave Suge Knight like that, you know, yeah. especially at that time. And for those who don't know much about Suge Knight, why, why when we talk about rappers killing each other, do we always talk about Suge Knight? <laughs> not allowed to say this on air. <laughs> no, off I'm the record. Going, I'm going off record on this. No, I think I, know, I, I you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm literally not sure. I want to talk about Suge Knight. I why, mean, why is why is it so dangerous to talk about it? Because his name comes up so much when people say when people there he has so many connections to dead rappers. Well, he also, I mean, they, they, the, if you if you read the Randall Sullivan book, was actually really illuminating. I, I I don't know how much of it is true. I assume it it was mostly true because mm-hmm. he he was seemingly seemingly incredible reporter and hasn't been discredited. But a lot of the Rampart scandal stemmed from you know the crooked cops that were working for yeah. for Death Row. I mean, there was a real a real like. I mean, it really is like an L.A. Confidential mm-hmm. Mulholland, you know, not Mulholland Drive, but uh, Chinatown, <laughs> <laughs> not Mulholland. Maybe a little Mulholland Drive. Maybe a little I'm sure there were a couple yeah. scenes where Tupac and Calabasas that right. you know. I, you know, I go by my old rule. If you need a private security force, you're doing something really horribly wrong. No, like, if you need a private security force every day, that's not good for your mm-hmm. performance in life at the moment. Is it? Does it still make sense to talk about East Coast, West Coast rivalries in rap, or is that day over? I think that day is over. I think it's over, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that purely the 90s that just flared up? And- it was purely these two, kind of. I mean, no, it mm-hmm. wasn't, because it was you had Tim Dog versus, you know, you had Dr. Dre, but... Yeah. With with some people, but it was they really exacerbated it. They turned it into a whole thing. Mm. M- MTV and the internet, you know, this is mm. something that Tupac and Biggie. I mean, they cre- their careers and their art production crested with MTV's presence in homes, which is you can never overstate that when you're talking about contemporary music because it either played or it didn't play a role. Um, and I just think they. Um, I think the internet has flattened. Flattened. Yeah, I well, use that I word specifically in, in the nineties. Definitely, I mean, Vibe magazine right. played like a role in kind of heightening the tension between mm. the two sides. You know, doing all these. Mm. You know, the source also probably played a big role in kind of right. fostering. You know, because the source famously would not give West Coast records the same mm. due yeah, that East Coast records would get. So you have this, and I think hip hop's always been. I mean, I think honestly, most kind of thing. You know, 
literature. There's always going to be like a war between like two, multiple sides. It's, I feel like it's parochial now. I mean, like yeah. it, like hip hop is parochial. Mm-hmm. Like I think that's interesting. You know, now people who are into hip hop, they know that UGK is from Port Arthur, Texas. They know they're not just from Texas, and they're from they're from Port Arthur, Texas. Mm-hmm. If you like Little Boozy, you know he's from Baton Rouge. He's not from New Orleans mm-hmm. or generalized, you know, the generalized South. And I think Tupac and Biggie did something incredible for a national audience because they you were able the listener was able to compare and see how they were different and i think yeah. that that c- conflict the conflict between east and west coast rap um the aftermath is now we're parochial and we're interested in different yeah. communities and that, and, that might be for the good and it was more complicated than just simple division you know like mm-hmm. tupac you know had got my mind made up on his on all as in me where he's got method man he's got red man there were rappers from the east coast you know that they he had an affinity with and there were you know conversely biggie did a song like going back to california right. it was you know where he's like uh, you know specifically saying he did not want every, everyone to kind of misconstrue it as like this kind of coastal kind of war and you know i i think like i think a big problem when it comes to you know cultural criticism is that everyone wants to reduce it to these really easy binaries. Mm, yeah. And the truth is like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes like binaries do exist, but most of the time it is a lot more complicated when I mean, you're dealing with two complex personalities. And I guess that's the point. Like this book is like, like a simple, here's a duality, Biggie versus Tupac. Right. You know what I mean? But we tried to be like, okay, right. no, like yeah. it's more than that. Yeah. I think we're working in the aftermath and we've, I mean, we've got more time since their deaths yeah. to think about what actually happens. And this is, you know, when we were lucky to read great firsthand reporting and yeah. other more, you know, frankly, really strict biographical books. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're operating on, in, in the shadow and on the shoulders of really, really essential first level journalism. Yeah. yeah, it needs to be said like this, you know, this is I, I would not say that this is like the definitive book. Like there's a lot of other. But I would say that maybe I would hope at least I wouldn't say because it's not my place to say, but I would hope that at least it may be breaks them down maybe a little more thoroughly without kind of the dogma and superstitions that have kind of accrued over the last 15 years since mm-hmm. they've been dead. You know, there's just rap, rap in general, but like also, you know, there's, there's these inherited ideas that people just accept at face value. And, you know, I wanted, you know, and I, I think Evan did too. We wanted to kind of not hold anything sacred mm-hmm. and just try to, you know, I mean, we don't. I've read your book, of course. I've read other things about Biggie and Tupac, but why did they hate each other so much? Like, what? what why, why don't we? Why don't we really seem to know? I mean, we know a lot about why they might have hated each other, but it's. It seems like it's. There's no straight answer ultimately to, like, especially not to who killed who, but why did? Why the animosity? Do you- well, basically, they were, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, they were best, for, you know, they, they really liked each other. I think Tupac saw something in Biggie that reminded him probably of himself and that he maybe that he couldn't do, you know, because there were things that Tupac couldn't, that Biggie could do that Tupac couldn't and vice versa. And so basically, they, you know, they did become friends. And during during Tupac's second album, which I don't like saying because it makes me feel awkward because, you know, <laughs> you can Google it. But uh Tupac was in New York he was also in New York uh when he was filming Above the Rim which I think is kind of where and Biggie kind of through a mutual contact Biggie you know hooked him up they they hooked up he hooked up with some kind of rather unsavory figures which ended up leading to his sexual assault trial which uh you know obviously was a huge you know shadow hangover he was going to jail he was recording me against the world it was this kind of tumultuous time and And, he was in New York and then and then and then he was assaulted and then he was assaulted and and shot shot and Biggie was and Biggie was at the studio uh, where he was shot and it was you know it was for what little sean it was like uh, like an obscure rapper that he no was, he was in the middle of the night he needed the money because he had this trial and it was like late at night and you know they were all biggie was with andre harrell and puff daddy i want to get this but you know you know famously biggie was walked out of the hospital or went, had to go to multiple hospitals and he was in bellevue in new york he gets he gets out of the hospital after being shot to go to his the trial his criminal his yeah. tupac, tupac to go to his criminal trial um you know, that is, that was, that was an incredible trauma. Yeah. Well, and I guess the crux of it is that he th- said, look, he didn't think Biggie was responsible for it. He may or may not have. It was never really clear, but he assumed, and like, there's probably a fair thing to say that, you know, it was a small studio, you know, it was not a small studio, but it was, you, mm-hmm. he would have known that there were these people waiting to assault him. I mean, he's there with like Puff Daddy, all these mm-hmm. people, you know, he, it was, he felt like it was a setup, mm-hmm. but then also, um, you know, it goes without saying that, like, it would have been fine, but then Biggie records a song called Who Shot Ya? Yeah. Right afterwards, which, I mean, 
<laughs> I don't know. And, and, and <laughs> no, as, I don't as, know. as I, you know, at best, I, bad judgment. I, yeah, tasteless. And, and I, as I, I, I wrote about that song in our new book, Tupac vs. Biggie, an illustrated history of rap fans battle in that. stores in stores now. Tell me more. Um, <laughs> but I get, so this song, you know, if you on, you know, when you, when you when you listen to it and you unpack it in your ears, and then if you choose to read the la- lyrics, you know, they're all these subliminal, and that's the, you know these subliminal, yeah. coded. <laughs> Taunts, and if yeah. you read their lives, that, that's there, and it's just part of it is a mystery. Part of it is, I think, there were just truly unnamed bad elements around them involved with drugs, violence, and money. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they, we said they came from middle class. They, so they, it, it was definitely not. Is it, yeah, it they, their, their yeah. lives got more dangerous as they went on, which was yeah. so compelling to me mm-hmm. because we have this American narrative of you rise from poverty and danger into safety, and they both. We're, we're surrounded by elements. At the same time, they're operating incredibly high social class, getting paid millions of dollars. And at the same time, they're surrounded by elements who were criminals. And this happens in American entertainment. Yeah. But this, well, it, you know, the notion of street credibility and authenticity in hip hop has always been kind of an interesting idea because I think like you can they they felt like especially with somebody like Tupac, you know, he felt like you know to be an, a credible voice of the streets, mm-hmm. you know, that he had to sort of live that life. Mm-hmm. And you know, especially after he played Bishop and Juice, you know, there's an interesting uh, exchange. Where Biggie was, I think, telling a reporter that towards the end of Tupac's life, he didn't see Tupac anymore. That wasn't the Tupac he knew. He saw Bishop from Jews. Who shot John? Separate the weak from the ops. Leap hard to creep them Brooklyn streets. It's on, nigga. Fuck all that bickering beef. I can hear sweat trickling down your cheek. Your heartbeat sound like Sasquatch's feet. Thundering, shaking the concrete. Then the shit stopped when I fall the plot. Neighbors call the cops and they heard mad shots. Saw me in the drop, three in the quarter. Slaughter, electrical tape around the daughter. Old school, new school, need to learn though. I burn, baby, burn like disco inferno. Burn slow like blunts with yayo. Feel more skins than Idaho potato. Niggas know the miracle molesting is taking place. Fucking with B.I.G. it ain't safe. Uh, I make your skin chase. Rashes on the masses. Bumps and bruises. Blunts and land cruisers. Big Papa smash fools, bad fools, niggas mad because I know the cash rules. Everything around me, two block nines. Any motherfucker whisperin' about mine. And uh, and uh, uh Brooklyn's finest. finest. You rewind this, bad boys behind bad boys. Uh. To go along with that, you know, you're going to acquire a different set of friends. You can't exactly, like, be hanging out with Jada Pinkett all day long. <laughs> Even though he, you know, he still did. Like, he he was hanging out with Madonna. It, 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 it's always, you know... um, Oh God, why did they hit each other? You know, there was something. And, you know, I think, I think it is just, part of it is just a mystery. Part and of it's jealousy. Part both, of it's jealousy. Because part. both could do the other thing that the other one couldn't. Right. And like, there's always like that sort of thing where it's like, you can either, like I said, like you can either be like, oh, well, that's great. Cause we're not competing in the same exact lane. But right. then there's a certain thing where, especially when you're being compared as two of the greatest ever, you want to be the greatest ever, mm. you know, you made a reference to Drake earlier in the podcast, Jeff. And I was mm. thinking about this and you, we, we've talked about social class and different kinds of identity narratives and different kinds of placement and, and, uh, and cho- choices of representing the self uh, through the music. And I think that both Tupac and Biggie had this relationship with, with really bad criminal elements that, and we know that maybe soul crack cocaine, that, Got, it got into the music first and the music itself. I mean, you know, I'm not going to lie. Both of their, some of those criminal transgressive lyrics are the ones I sing to myself and <laughs> stick in my head and, and stay in my ear. Um, and anyone would be a fool or a milk toast or a liar to admit that the, that isn't some of the most thrilling and yeah, pleasurable part of their content. Um, and that's another thing you have to think about when you're listening to them. Um, it, does it involve the American outlaw? Yeah, kind of. Does it involve that they died because they both made people feel invincible? Right. Does it does it does it involve with the Reagan era? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, it's all involved with this this cultivation of self, and I, um, yeah, I, I think. I think it's just fascinating. Um, sorry, you know, I get lost sometimes uh, just thinking about it because it's just, um, I want to quote more lyrics, but they just, they, they pass through my head. This so is the quickly. freestyle portion of the interview. <laughs> We're really going to have to edit, edit, edit the hell out of this. Um, it, it's so, um, you know, I just, I just think that there's just so much to talk about. I'm going to stop talking for a second. I realize I'm repeating myself. What does, uh, well, I mean, what do Biggie and Tupac? Biggie and Tupac's albums sound like now, playing them in the context of when you're listening to 
modern rap as well up against everything else that's out today how do they sound different than they once did you know what you know it's funny is like i actually we had this uh i'm doing a column for my website passion of the west and it's it's we're getting all these different writers to talk about an album or an artist that they never heard before and i remember you did it for a website we used to write for uh style styles, styles yeah. magazine r.i.p so. So, it was a great magazine. He, one of these kids, he's he's got to be twenty three years old, and he he never heard Tupac. Mm. And uh, Tupac is kind of one of these interesting yeah. figures because a lot of people have heard you know the Tupac greatest hits, but mm. they haven't heard the actual you know deep cuts or the rarities. Or because I mean it's sprawling, it's really hard to get a handle on. Mm. And he's like, I don't understand what is up with these like these big singers in every chorus. And he's like, is that like a nineties thing? And like he was totally <laughs> like, and you, I went back and listened, to it and you're like, yeah, Tupac has a lot of really big, but he also, you know, they, they're, it runs the gamut, you know, a song like, but a song like Dear Mama, you know, you have this big mm-hmm. overblown kind of chorus and it kind of gets in, I mean, and you can still say it like early Kanye West kind of still had that thing, you know, but it, it, it seemed to go out of kind of vogue. Now I feel you know, Tupac's catalog is, it, it, it's sort of, we were talking about this earlier. It's different on, he, he really reinvented himself on every album. Mm-hmm. So, and that's again goes back to the Rorschach blot idea where it's like, you, he, you can reinvent yourself with every Tupac album. Mm-hmm. You know, you have this first album where it's two, it's called Tupacalypse now. And that was kind of where he had the, it's a very like Black Panther inspired, very politically radical album. Mm-hmm. Second album, you know, recorded in new york it's like a new york street rap album from the 1993 mm-hmm. third album me against the world recorded while he's waiting to go into jail and it's personal it was the first number one album ever to come out when an artist was in jail and it's just, it's probably his most complete work because it's mm-hmm. you know the, the sexual assault trials hanging over his head he feels you know kind of be- betrayed it, the, everything is kind of going into it it's what he it says one of the most emotionally charged albums in, in american pop music of the past 30 years yeah it's, it's, it's just, incredible to think that this is pop music yeah, quite so, honestly like mm-hmm. it's weird to think and so, Right. You know, and then you have All Eyes on Me, which is one of the greatest gangster rap records ever. I mean, that is just a hard record. It's just like, you know, I remember growing up here and like Persians and BMWs would just roll pump like all day long. Like you would never not hear it out of a Persian and a BMW. Not to make any generalizations, but I, I just I did go to school. <laughs> so it just happened. Yeah, I think that's interesting that that Tupac ability to shift um, and really vehemently take on different identities and really emotional identities. Maybe that contributes to his resonance because, you know, as you go through different life stages and different parts of life, you have a new emotional states and new ways of looking at the world. And Tupac just went through so many different ways of looking at the world mm, yeah. that, that, com- that, that's commercial- appealing universally there's and translates reality. very well. You know, there's a commercial reality at play. You know, I always think of Tupac actually, you know, I used Bob Dylan earlier, but I think of him more as kind of like a, a Jim Morrison kind of ish figure where it's like, you know, you have the shirtlessness, like the kind of re the, uh, the desire for reinvention, the, you know, flawed in convention, you know, the, the struggles with the law, with substance abuse, uh, you know, and you know, the door, totally the dorm room poster archetype. Mm. And mm. I think of him and also Jim Morrison inspires like a lot of hate. So it's like, see, I can, I mean, I, I, I wasn't alive when the doors, you know, w- were a functioning unit, but I got into, the, I, I got into the doors right around the time I got into Tupac. And there's mm. probably somebody said about that when you're a young kid, it's just sort of, you, you gravitate towards these like rebel figures. I think if you have a rebellious personality, if you think that this is kind of bullshit like these teachers are kind of you're like, you're like ah these teachers I don't want to wake up at 8am down with no, homework yeah down with homework you know <laughs> like I can't deal with this I think my coaches are dumb or whatever your teachers are dumb and you gravitate towards that and then you you know you 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 these figures kind of I think for a lot of people probably Tupac is you know I always say like he's like LA's patron saint at this yeah, point. I, I mean I this is a question I'm, I have a question. Um, mm. Do you think that Tupac has more songs in number that are sort of in the in the general pop culture consciousness? Songs in number, not the quality, but the the, the, the number of good songs well, is more than big. Your mom was in the Library of Congress. You know, it's right. a fair point. It's a fair point. Yeah, but you know, because you talked about you know being in different cultural settings beyond, let's say, the white middle class and cultural settings, yeah. and different places on Earth, and hearing it. Yeah. Um, and I wonder about that. I had sort of jotted a note down here, and I was thinking about it. That to me, another useful contrast, since we're talking about getting into them and listening to them, is that Tupac has the better greatest. Tupac has the greatest better hits album. I mean, if you look at all, if you took the best hits of Tupac's career and put them on a greatest, a really good, Seven. well thought out greatest hits album, it's one of the be- best greatest hits albums ever. To me, yeah, it's a Biggie fan. Biggie might have the better kind of like 
if you're going to talk, album like we were in the cuts. 60s or 70s, album cuts. D oh, yeah. album cuts. Yeah. Ones that are not pop, not pop song. No, yeah. not pop you singles. You have to listen to like 30 times because right. you're like just trying to figure them out. They become mm-hmm. indispensable and they're your, you personalize them. They're your go-to deep album cut. And for listeners who are new to rap and especially want to use this book as a way to get into Tupac and Biggie, I think that that might be a helpful way of thinking about it for general music listeners. Mm. And does do the bodies of work of, of Tupac and Biggie today... Do they have much to say about rap now as a music, or is it just, are we listening to Tupac and Biggie specifically there, their own self-contained sphere, and that's what you're in when you're listening to them in 2013? I think it's inextricable, because I think a lot of the artists still, and maybe maybe a little less so, but even like, you know, I, I mentioned Kendrick Lamar earlier, his favorite rapper is Tupac, you know, the guy's 25 years old, you know, you have... Uh, Little, little Boosie's probably the most popular. Little Wayne. I mean, he, what did he say a few weeks ago? He said, I'm the new Pac. Or, you know, it's always... I and, mean, and, and But yet little, yet little Wayne's technique is totally influenced by Biggie. Mm-hmm. Sort of, I, I think about it like it's a pole. And the way you're a contemporary rapper is like, you have to navigate the space between Biggie and Tupac. And there are, there are a, a handful of other truly influential yeah. MCs, rappers. Scarface, Big Daddy Kane, um, who were before Tupac and Biggie's time. Um... And but yet today every contemporary rapper may have those influences. UGK, Eminem. Pu- Public Enemy, I mean, Eminem is, and it, yeah. it's, it's through them. It's like Eminem is might not be, you know he's influenced a lot of people. And who was dying to produce a posthumous but, Tupac album? But Eminem. Eminem himself has really deep Biggie elements and really deep Tupac elements. It's yeah. it's I I mean I, I'll I'll they make like, the argument they study Biggie, they trumpet you know right. Tupac. Every 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 contemporary rapper. Um, who's really working with something, mm. I think to my ears at least, is really navigating the space with Tupac and Biggie because mm. together together they did so much. Mm. Um, technique, content, form, p- performance, presentation mm. that, you know, I, we were talking in the car like, okay, well, who do we like? Well, we both like Currency. We both like Freddie Gibbs. We both like Aesop Rocky, Schoolboy Q. And we're looking at how these... We talk about, oh, that sounds so much like Biggie, the way he used that detail. Or like, God, this chorus, just, it sounds like Tupac. And we say that a lot. I, I also think it, you know, it should just, you know, be out there and, and just said, like, you can't disregard the impact that, like, you know, I'm, I'm saying this, you know, we talked earlier about the race issue, and you know, I'm saying this is like a white person. You can't ignore or diminish the impact that Tupac had as like a voice for like, you know, not just black people, but maybe like all people that, you know, are living under what they sense to be oppression or, you know, whether it is or not, mm-hmm. you know, and he really like it's a sense of struggle. And that's something that continually echoes over and over again. And like he really was speaking for a uh, dispossessed, you know, and in the 90s, you know, it, you know, obviously, it, you know, it was a mixed bag. It wasn't like, you know, the, the Clinton, Clinton boom was like this, you know everyone got rich you know there was a lot of people like living in poverty and tupac is really speaking for them and especially and that's why i think like he has emerged as this kind of malleable figure where you can be interpreted you know if you want you can pick tupac songs as pub as political as public enemy songs Mm -hmm. and but you can also pick you know songs as 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 gangster you know or as misogynistic or whatever as a two live crew song or as gangster (laughs) as you know nwa i'll I'll just i'll just pitch this that i think biggie if we're talking about truly their, their most transcendent qualities, I think Biggie is one of the best American artists on money and, <laughs> and rising and social class and detail. Like, and I'm serious, you know, whether it's James Baldwin or Henry James or any other artist who works with words, I think Biggie is saying incredible things about work, money, power, and class in America. And I just, it's, it's, it's indispensable in my life to think about those big American themes. Mm. Well, he was a master, I think, of like the aphorism, Biggie. You know what mm. I mean? Like, just these little, like, just... Like in in four words, he could just convey so much information. You know, it's just mm-hmm. a cond- a condensed and and that's just New York kind of in a way, right? You know, it's like you don't have that much room to spread out. You know, you get it's like like quit the bullshit asshole. <laughs> Whereas like Tupac's like kind of rambling with you know Stone, like kind of California, I, like I like that I like that idea of the rambling California you talked about <laughs> earlier. I, I mean, that, obviously, I empathize. I think it's really fitting. I think it's really fitting. I, I just I wonder if we now are embodying our different like cultural milieus. Like suddenly, if I realize I'm talking really fast, the like East Coast Irish is coming out of me. For, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm not wearing a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> no, I have several tattoos across my back. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 interesting. I um their whole their whole manners of presentation, you know, are are totally informed by where they grew up. And since this is the LA review of books, I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. They're so they're so tied into their experiences and their 
portrayals of their respective cities. Mm. But overall, if you listen to just one of them, you're not getting a complete rap experience, are you? No. If you really, if your allegiance is really I, true to just one, I, I, yeah, I would argue that. You, and the thing I think that a lot of people think about rap, and you know, I, I'm, I'm saying because I, I hope that a lot of people that are kind of more literary types, you know, maybe who you know think like, I don't know, an animal collective or a mountain goats or you know whatever, you know whatever indie songwriter you know you you, you choose to be the most influential or whatever. I feel like rap is a lot more than. It's going to sound like such an underground bromide, but like it's a lot more than what you maybe hear on the radio. And like both these artists were heard on the radio, but there were a lot of like underground artists that influenced them. And there's a lot of amazing writing that kind of goes on, um, you know, whether it's just a, a great simile, mm-hmm. a color, you know, a, an amazing image, like a metaphor that you wouldn't think. And both these guys were probably were, were, were masters of, of it for sure. Mm-hmm. But but there is such a rich like array of people that, you know go so far beyond this and like you can't necessarily like they maybe stood on the top you know what i mean like they stood on the top but there were a lot of people that they were kind of building yeah. off of their were their words their vocabularies are part of the american lexicon at this yeah. point no one no one can do anything about it they are part of the american le- mo- they're, money part of the, problems, they're part right? of the american lexicon and if that's not success as an artist i don't know what is mm. i've been speaking with jeff weiss and evan mcgarvey authors co-authors of tupac versus biggie an illustrated history of rap's greatest battle gentlemen thanks so much thank This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can find much more at lareviewofbooks.org. Stores, the mom pop spots, and our people. All y'all are. LA, California Love Park, motherfucking two. Without getting straight.